Well, it's time to discuss the latest gaseous expulsion Game of Thrones bloated carcass has graced us with. The Last of the Starks opens on Ian Glenn and Alfie Allen pretending to be dead so they don't have to be in this shit show anymore. Good move. Sansa invents a new position and gives it to a dead man as a fuck you to all the living people because even as a corpse, Theon could do a better job than you, Davos. Man, it's annoying seeing how unscathed the main characters are. Jon has a boo-boo on his cheek. He died once! This is nothing! Danny is completely untouched. Arya's only injury from the day she thwarted the goddamn apocalypse is a bump on the noggin she got from running into a wall. Yeah, yeah, that thing we built up to for seven years, let's make it have as few consequences as possible. There was no sacrifice in killing the Night King, nothing real anyway, nothing that affects anything. Sure, Jorah and Theon are dead, but is this really felt? Do they feel like they're missing? Like if they had lived, things would be so much easier? Did Aya actually go through anything to save the world? She didn't even know Jorah and we've never seen her interact with Theon. Aya didn't lose anything. Remember when Tyrion killed Tywin and everything changed? He lost his home and his family and his friends and his fucking composure and even some of his mind. It was tough. What changes for Aya when she kills Rhaegar? Everyone likes her more now. Fuck. But we're not here to bitch about episode 3, we're here to bitch about coffee cups and unloved dogs. How fucking dare you show me a battle-torn ghost without having first shown me his involvement in the battle? Was the objective here to insult the audience as much as conceivably possible? Okay, so the speech is good and Kit gives his best performance in a long time. All the main characters or whatever get to burn the pyre with their favourite corpse on top. Hey Danny, why don't you get on with him? That did wonders for you last time. Enough of all that grieving, it's time to party! Okay, so Danny just calls Gendry out of the crowd on his way to find some tang and I cannot get through this scene without laughing. It's just such embarrassing writing. Danny brings up the attempt on her life and we don't even get a shot of Varys disappearing into the hedges. Danny then asks, <laughs> she asks who the Lord of Storm's End is and I can't handle it. So I was at the UN the other day and the Secretary General asked me if I knew who the President of China was. I thought she was joking so I said no but then she turned around and asked the whole UN who the President of China was and fucking nobody knew. So she turns back to me, she does, and she says, get this, she says, you know what, screw it, you're the President of China now. Even though we're not entirely sure there isn't already a President of China. That's a real scene. That happened. Tyrion says that this has secured Gendry's undying loyalty, which, even though I know Tyrion is way, way smarter than me, is a really fucking stupid thing to say. You know when Rob Stark secured Walder Frey's loyalty with a betrothal? You know when Ned secured Littlefinger's loyalty with Cat's promise? You know when you secured Shay's loyalty with a bag of cash? How does the amnesia keep spreading? Don't drink the water, it's got amnesia in it. Danny, you just legitimized and gave significant power to the only remaining son of the last undisputed king. What a fucking moron. Davos and Tyrion are all chummy because Davos drank the water and doesn't remember Tyrion exploding his son and ruining his king. They're trying so hard to drum up tension between the Jon and Danny camps, pulling so hard on the weakest threads, and Mathos is just staring at us. Bring up Mathos! There's your tension! I can't believe Davos is the caring, down-to-earth voice of fatherly reason this show desperately needs him to be when he's forgotten his own son's death. Then we have a convo about Beechair's new digs instead of, for example, where the Greyjoy fleet might be. Bran says some shit about Daron Targaryen and a crippled nephew. We know of six Darons, but only one that was of wheelchair designing age around 120 years ago, Daron the Good, whose only sibling was Daenerys, who married the Prince of Dawn. So unless they're implying that Doran Martell was like a hundred years old, in season 5, this is total bullshit. It's fine though, because my headcanon is that Bran just likes making shit up about history because people have to believe him anyway. Take that, Tyrion, you fucking hack. Arya Stark, the hero of Winterfell. <laughs> We get this weird drinking game scene that I don't understand because I've never seen season one of this show. Yeah, we get it, there's a fucking Starbucks cup on the table. I'm sure this would have crippled the Immersion's nephews if it had any. I'm starting to think that this was put here on purpose, right? Hear me out as a distraction. Think about it, if everyone on the internet is talking about a surface level goof that we can fix after the fact, then that's fewer people talking about how the entire episode is irreparably dreadful. Stop talking about the cup, you're being had! Here, north of the wall, and then back 
left here again. He keeps fighting. He keeps fighting. They ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Here's the shot I was looking for earlier of Varys making sure Danny hasn't noticed him. Danny doesn't like someone else being the center of attention. Brienne brings up Tysha, and because the screenwriters despise us, Tyrion and Jamie do not discuss that story at all. You're a virgin. Well, I'm definitely using this clip in arguments on the internet. For some reason, things get weird when Brienne's maidenhood is mentioned, but like, isn't she past this? Good to get confirmation on the brothel bard theory, though. Tormund's finally summoned the confidence to ask out his crush and cracks a hilarious faux pas. Dude, just fucking kidnap her. Are you even a real wildling? Shake my head. People trying to emotionally interact with the hound is mood. Podboy strikes a three-way the natural way. Good going, son. It is shocking that the Sansa hound scene is in episode four. He's been here the whole time and they haven't talked yet, which is nuts considering how fucked Sansa was without him. But this scene is actually good. There's no lines that are outright insane, and it showcases character growth for Sansa, and you know what? Get on the list. That's right. I'm doing it. The character was fucking awful for the last two seasons, but in season 8, I'm actually happy to see Sansa on screen. Just a quick reminder that this is indeed the darkest timeline. Who practices archery in a fucking doorway? No, it's just a little psycho, of course. Be careful, Genders. She doesn't have proficiency in that. He's so startled that he forgets what his name was. So many people don't understand the bastard names. First, only recognized highborn bastards get the names. Gendry was lowborn, a fucking peasant. No last name for you unless it's your goddamn trade. Second, it's not where you're born, it's where you're raised. See Brynden Rivers, Aegor Rivers, Obara Sand, Nymeria Sand, and Sorella Sand. So no, he was never gonna be Jon Sand, get out with that shit. Thirdly, Gendry, nobody has ever called you Rivers in the history of anything ever. It's time to stop drinking, man, we're worried about you. I'm pretty sure this isn't a cultural tradition in Westeros, so maybe Gendry's leg just started cramping and he needed to get on his knees. He does a second night proposal and gets shot down harder than the show's ratings. Don't laugh, we've all been there. That's not me. Aya makes a reference to season 7. Hang on, that's season 1, don't you lie to me! Man, don't you hate it when the person you're talking to makes a starry-eyed reference to an event from their past that you don't have any idea about and then they just walk away? You can just tell in this shot that the director asked Gwendolyn to act with her face more. Is this why we kept Brienne alive last episode? Imagine if instead of this scene we had a grieving Jamie fucking ruined at the fact that he couldn't swallow his pride enough to express his feelings for her before she died. And that drives him to go south. Jamie's still on the list, but you're on thin ice, bucko. <laughs> Danny's worried that Jon is a more inspiring leader to the local folk, and turns out she's a really supportive significant other. It doesn't matter what you want. She's got some crazy eyes going on when she tells Jon to repress the truth about himself, so I'm sure their relationship is healthy. Might be time to see a couple's counselor. You know Kyburn's a qualified therapist? Danny wants the future of her rule to be built on a lie. I'm coming to like Jon more and more as a frustrated proponent of peace and compromise, like his father before him. No, not that one. Danny storms off because her boyfriend refuses to not tell his family the most important thing ever. Okay, this scene's an absolute riot. Wormo tells us that only half of the Unsullied died last episode, which seems impossible. Jon says half of the Northmen are dead also because he doesn't actually know. He heard what Grey Worm said and thought, yeah, half has a nice ring to it. Bronzion takes half the Vale forces away as well, and only half the Dothraki? Are you fucking kidding me? I have to wonder if all the episodes this season were written by completely different teams who weren't allowed to ask each other questions. Varys says that Fed the sword has delivered Buck Strickland to King's Landing, but fails to mention that Kyburn has teleported the city in its entirety. Tyrion reminds Danny not to explode anything, so she's just not liking today. Varys says that the new Prince of Dawn supports Danny, and why do we even fucking bother with this show? Why would you even mention Dawn, you buffoons? Okay, let's go back to writing 101, because I guess that's what Game of Thrones reviews are these days. Usually when you're writing dialogue or anything, you want each line to develop the plot, develop the characters, or develop the world. This line about the new Prince of Dawn is unlikely to be relevant to the plot, shows us that the characters are imbeciles for not knowing shit about the world, which is also disintegrating around them. The thing is, it would have been less effort to not include this total insult of a line. People went out of their way for this. I do like how much people are mentioning the Iron Fleet though. The plan makes no sense, but fuck, you already know that. At the family meeting, Jon makes the same mistake Missande did in the last episode. No, you wouldn't all be dead without Danny. Rhaegar wouldn't have made it past the wall without Danny. Every time it's mentioned that Arya killed Rhaegar, I have an involuntary bodily reaction. Arya's the one that killed the Night King. Um, Jon decides to tell his sisters the thing, provided they don't tell anyone. 
Aya means it, but Sansa doesn't because she learned how to not be a moron from Dowager Cersei and pre-nerf Littlefinger. She uses the possession of valuable information as a commodity to bend things to her will. That's interesting. Anyway, we don't even get to see Sansa and Aya learning about the biggest deal ever because this show has a great deal of contempt for its audience. Instead, we get an extremely important scene where Tyrion and Jaime discuss not discussing Brienne's snatch. I fucking love Nikolai's delivery here. What? Just as Tyrion reminds us that he used to be a character, I am the imp, the two of them collectively hallucinate Bronn entering the room. This is so baffling, I thought it was a dream sequence. Okay, so half of the Unsullied is still alive, but none of them are guarding Winterfell. Is Winterfell only four miles from King's Landing now that Kyburn has teleported the capital? So Bronn can just walk into an undefended room with two of the most important people in the world. What's stopping him from walking into Danny's room and just shooting her without announcing himself with a dog shit one-liner? Like, sure, he's trying to play the situation to get the most out of it, but if he just kills Danny, then the war's over and he can probably ask for a raise from Cersei. Or kill her too and just crown himself king. Fuck it, I'm sure it would work in this show. Vote Bronn for Iron Throne. So this scene is filled to the brim with lines that piss me off. For starters, Bronn says that Jamie and Brienne Must be like looking in the mirror. Which pisses me off because Cersei and Jamie are near identical in the books and their love for each other has a great sense of vanity and narcissism to it. Jamie and Brienne should signify the complete opposite of that. But fuck character growth. Have you seen season six? Then Tyrion says You broke my nose! Which pisses me off for obvious reasons. They're just telling us, hey, remember this cool thing from the books that we didn't do? Fuck you! Bronn says that Cersei offered him River Run and wonders what double river run would be. Even though the twins are staring him right in his fucking genius face, Tyrion says High Garden because apparently all of these extremely important seats are just empty. Hey, remember all the squabbling over who gets Rosby in a feast for crows? Fuck you! Bronn almost brings up Land the Clever and this is actually interesting. He's using information as a commodity to bend things to his will. Fuck, we're only halfway through this shit. It's time for the- The Bending Ground! The Aya Hound scene is not the worst but it's only there to check if I remember season 4. The Sansa-Tyrion scene might just be the nicest smelling shit in the whole pile. Even though it started out quite dumbly, the Sansa-Danny tension is so much more believable and compelling than the insane Arya-Sansa rivalry they tried to do last season. This scene blows Chode. Jon says, Rhaegar needs to heal. Which is great setup for him flying to Dragonstone for no reason. Tormund's taking his people back north of the... Well, he's taking them north. Jon tells him to take Ghost too, which could have been good if there was a touching heartfelt goodbye. Oh well. Nobody mentions or even alludes to to Igret because John drank the water. John realizes that Gilly is fat. They're going to name it John if it's a boy. Though John's response is fun and still true to his character, this is a great opportunity for John to instead recommend Pip or Gren or Jao or Eamon or Carl fucking Tanner or most importantly Ed. <laughs> I think I figured out what Tyrion and Bran talked about off screen in episode 2. They were either trying to keep track of the jetpacks or Bran convinced Tyrion that Robert's rebellion was built on a lie. Tyrion and Varys talking politics gives a great nostalgia high and it's better than most of this episode but there's still some dumb shit like saying that close relation marriages never happened in the north and ignoring the obvious solution of marrying Jon and Danny but letting Danny rule solely on her own giving Jon a nominal title. Win win win. Oh well. I also thought this was a dream sequence because it's so insane. Sure, it's surprising, but I'm pretty sure a six-year-old wrote this. I'm not 100% on this quite yet, but it's highly likely that this is the stupidest scene in the show's whole run, and I doubt that it'll be topped in the next two episodes. I can't wait to be proven wrong, though. There are multiple things wrong with every single event that occurs in this scene. Being surprised by a fleet you knew about when you were hundreds of feet up in the air. Three impossible anti-dragon surface-to-air missile strikes on Rhaegal, followed by none on Drogon. Killing the dragon here instead of in the giant battle last episode. You're on not fucking capturing Dragonstone. There simply isn't enough time to nitpick this, but I also feel like there's no need. Everyone understands why this is flat out ridiculous. Hey, do you remember the merman theory? Missandei! Wait, you mean Missandei didn't wash up on this exact section of beach in the 40 seconds we've been here? It's not like corpses ever sink or drift in different directions, which is moot anyway because there's no way she could have died in that incident wherein many people died. That must mean that Euron captured her. There's no other explanation. Yes, he somehow swooped in with his giant fleet and picked out the body of a person he's only seen once and never interacted with. Are you fucking kidding me? 
Euron is more excited about his baby than Sam is about his. Even though she's been banned from exploding things, Danny plans to explode King's Landing and blame it on Cersei for not stopping her. Ah uh, yes, truly the arbiter of freedom. There's another alright scene of Tyrion and Varys talking treason. This episode is great at reminding us how fucking cool to watch these characters once were. Unfortunately, Varys says, He's the heir to the throne. Yes, because he's a man. Objection! John would be the rightful heir even if he were a woman. Oh god, not this scene. Jamie gets hit with the reality of the situation and decides he wants to be a part of it. Sir Brienne of Tarth, of the Rainbow Guard, Slayer of Stannis Baratheon, Sworn Protector of Winterfell, Top Bay Strong Woman Feminist Icon, is out in the cold wearing a nightgown crying over a man leaving her. <coughs> She's so strong! While confessing his love for Cersei, Jamie tells Brienne he crippled Bran, which in the show she doesn't know, but she doesn't react at all. We have your translator. Surrender now or you won't be able to understand foreigners who are at this point irrelevant. I have no fucking idea why Cersei doesn't just kill all of these people right now. Situations like this make the entire conflict feel so contrived. Tyrion tries to appeal to Kyburn's humanity, which is a pisser. Now! Kill him! Just kill him! What the f- Fuck! They hate you, and you hate them. I can't hear you! What? I said I can't hear you! Hey Euron, isn't it weird that Tyrion knows that Cersei is Pregante? Like, you're the father and you literally just found out, so how could he know? Doesn't really add up. Ah oh, well, I guess we'll worry about it later. This scene would have been so much better if Wormo thought Missandei was already dead. Dracarys! Why the fuck didn't you say value Magoolies? That would have been so much better. You know that I'm taking you to war. You may go hungry, you may fall sick, you may be killed. Valar Mogulis. Dracarys. Valar Dracarys. Valar Mogulis. Dracarys. Fuck, this show doesn't even get a line right when it's just one single word. Greg gives Missande the old one and done. So the big question of this episode is, but is it worse than The Long Night? Now yes, pretty much everything of significance that happens in The Last of the Starks makes no sense at all, but at least it didn't waste eight years of build-up for an undeserved anticlimax. It just seems like the dumb fallout of the dumb nuclear bomb they dropped last week. There's more dialogue, so it seems a lot stupider, but episode four didn't demolish what remained of the show's integrity. That damage was already done. This episode gets 16 White Walkers out of 16 because there's actually a payoff for Gilly being fat. Lol. <coughs> See you in the next stupid battle episode, you dumbass.